The earliest form of gas light fitting was something like this, and it simply mimics the candle with one flame. But this model from 1820 gives us more light by having all these flames. And what a wonderful light that is. But these beautiful naked flames were inefficient. They wasted heat. By using that heat to make a gauze glow, the gas mantle of 1885 looked like it would be the leading light. We've got a wonderful white light that's given off from its surface. And that surface is a fabric gauze. It's a coated fabric gauze. The mantle even has a sort of dimmer and was invented by Austrian chemist Baron Karl Auer, who found that cotton coated with compounds of cerium and thorium gave off light when they were heated by a flame. It's amazing how much light these three fragile gas mantles can give off. They fully light this little room area here. And light was what the gas companies were all about until the electricity companies came along with the electric light bulb. Big competition. The first electric bulbs arrived in the 1870s after experiments by Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison. But gas had the advantage of already being piped into people's homes. The gloves were off. Or were they on? The good people at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester have insisted I wear these gloves because I'm about to handle some of their precious objects. And these objects are light bulbs, and some of the most early light bulbs are these two. They're both from around the turn of the century, and that's the 20th century. That's just as old as that one, but it has the familiar shape of the contemporary bulb today, with the bayonet fitting there and the sort of balloon-like shape there. It's carbon, it's got a carbon filament inside, and as the carbon burnt, it tended to fill the bulb with carbon and block out the light. Also, the early carbon filaments burned out in a matter of hours, and the first bulbs cost 25 shillings, about two weeks' wages. Not surprisingly, gaslight was shining through as our preferred lighting, particularly as mains electricity was still rare in the early 1900s. Even when we did start to wire up the country, different towns had different voltages, which meant appliances couldn't be standardised or moved around. The electric companies had to innovate, and the breakthrough came when the metal tungsten was used in the filament. Its very high melting point produced bulbs that lasted up to a thousand hours. They even tried wrapping the tungsten bulbs in little lenses to maximise the light. There's one, one bulb they've allowed me to play with, and it's this one. Ah, and it's got this coil, this loop, which gives maximum surface area to allow lots of light to come off it. Now, it looks quite crude, and it's hard to believe that people used to jump for joy at this wonder of the age. The tungsten bulb had finally extinguished the domestic gaslight by the 1930s, and it's still the most popular bulb in our homes today. <laughs> wow, amazing. But perhaps we should all be really amazed by this, a very, very low energy light, which is almost cold to the touch because it's so efficient. It gives all its energy out as light. This bulb has no filament at all. It's a bent-up fluorescent tube using about one-fifth of the electricity of a tungsten bulb. And a visit to a high street lighting shop these days shows there's no end to the way we use electric light. All these different designs and styles show me that it's not just a functional thing, it's, a, it's an expression of where we're at, really. It's a, not just the fittings, the light, the quality of light. We paint with light, and we flit round these lights like moths round a flame. Having lost the lighting battle, the gas companies had to come up with other appliances that would keep their flame alive. Now, apart from the cooker, they had to think about wild and wacky things that might be powered by gas. And one of them is this, well, is it nautical? Hello there. Ah. Nautical though it may look, it's a hairdryer. There's the heat source, pipe, dry, dry, dry. And over here we've got a what looks like a familiar fridge, but it's gas powered. But my favourite really is the radio. Two pieces of metal in here are heated by a flame, which produces a charge, charges a battery, and that powers the radio. <laughs> strange though all these products are, gas has stood the test of time. We still heat our homes with it and we can still cook with it, it's nice and controllable. But the light has gone with all the other products. 
but really this was the most beautiful and the only source of light for several generations. Strings of a mellow cello when lights are low. To get gas to those delicate little lamps, we need slightly beefier engineering. And to begin with, that means pipes. And once upon a time, pipes were made from cast iron or steel. But these days, it tends to be flexible plastic, which is heavy enough in itself. But it doesn't come much beefier than this, this giant tin can. This is our gas holder, and this is where all the gas comes from before it comes to our houses. As the gas flows in, it's just the pressure that holds up the three massive sections. The gas doesn't leak away, as the whole thing sits in a 14 million gallon pool of water. But if you could swim in here, you'd definitely need a gas mask. It's a clever design that I've been proud of myself. Now when gas was manufactured in towns, it was called town gas, that was the only place to put it. But now we get our gas from the North Sea, it comes from the North Sea through pipes into the big tank here and is held in reserve for when it's most needed. When demand is high, the same pipe lets gas out and then overnight it refills again. It really takes hours, but we've gone for some high-speed gas here just to show you the beautiful way the sections screw into each other. It's like a massive piece of kinetic sculpture. Some of these Goliaths are still bobbing up and down after 130 years, whatever the weather. Natural gas really does work for us. But there's one last thing we have to do before it's safer to use in the home.